because a lot of the foundations of linguistics come from philosophy and philosophers? Well, so, okay, for semantics and pragmatics, absolutely, yes. The short version of that story is that in the 1950s, on the heels of the development of higher order logics, uh, a bunch of philosophers turned their attention to natural language, in particular, Richard Montague and David Lewis. But there was a whole group of them who were interested in logic uh, as applied to language. And so that's where the term Montague grammar comes from. Montague was a philosopher at UCLA. Um, and then it took some linguists, in particular, Barbara Partee, but there were others who helped translate these, those ideas from the sphere of philosophy of language into real concerted study of linguistic phenomena. And that heritage is still with us today. So we still use lambda calculus just the way Montague mm -hmm. did. And a lot of the techniques and assumptions just carry over. You saw that like maybe the default way that linguists think about proper names is a kind of Kripkean version where they directly refer. You could find exceptions just like you can in philosophy, but you know, that's very influential. And then the same thing is true for pragmatics. You know, Grice was a philosopher at most of his career at Berkeley, but you know, he began as an ordinary language philosopher in the UK. And he's had wide influence in philosophy, but I would say it's nothing compared to the influence that he's had for linguistic pragmatics. That's still the centerpiece of how essentially everyone thinks about oh, wow. language and interaction. So that's still when we, we, we read logic and conversation in that intro course. And, you know, the field has moved on in many ways, but in many ways it remains grounded or mired uh, in all these ideas from the mid 20th century. Hmm. And I'll, the final thing I'll say, this might be of interest, you know, a lot of people say that the way science works is that it begins in philosophy and graduates into its own field. And there are many historical examples of that. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that the study of linguistic meaning graduated from philosophy and became its own thing in the field of linguistics. And that happened recently. Yeah, that uh, I, I've said this a few times on the podcast, but there's a, a professor of mine in the philosophy department here, Nadim Hussein, who uh, once he told me that everything starts as philosophy. And then once the questions become tractable and there is an agreed methodology for solving them, then they get uh, doled out to the sciences. Yeah, that's perfectly reasonable as a description and uh, of linguistic semantics. And Barbara Partee was a major player in that. David Lewis participated as well. He was good as an ambassador. Montague was not uh -huh. um, particularly a good ambassador, but Partee saw the kind of inspiring ideas there. And there were a bunch of linguists, Jim McCauley, Larry Horn, and others who saw that in Grice as well and became ambassadors for Grice. Something that is already um, striking to me from talking to you and obviously from looking at your material is that even, well, maybe, maybe you are a, a philosopher as well. Maybe you think of yourself as a philosopher and a linguist, but a lot of people in the, the academy, though I, I shudder to refer to it as the academy, outside of philosophy, tend to look down on philosophers. Mm -hmm. So it's neat that uh, you find them so important for linguistics. And maybe maybe in this case, it's like you said, since Grice, for instance, is so important to pragmatics, it, it would be hard to uh, say otherwise. Well, a couple things that the one thing I could say is that I feel like philosophers would do well to pay more attention to what's happening on the empirical side in linguistics and update their own worldviews more frequently than they seem yeah. to. That would be the negative part. The positive part is that I would not call myself a philosopher. It's been a long time since I actually did philosophy, except, you know, kind of alongside with Thomas and John Echemendi for that piece I mentioned. And I think that philosophy is a skill, just like any other. And I can tell that many people in the scientific and engineering world do not think that it's a skill and therefore think that they can philosophize and not get themselves immediately in hot water. And they get themselves in hot water. They say things that are philosophically ridiculous mm -hmm. that seem like truisms to them only because they haven't thought about it. And they didn't really think to think that it was harder than it looked, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not a mistake they make for their own fields, of course. Uh, it's just a mistaken assumption that philosophy is something you can just do by musing aloud when it is, in fact, a skill that you hone, just like you hone a skill at programming and 
building large scale NLP systems. Yeah, I think of it as a skill for one sniffing out questions, but also a skill for uh, reasoning about them in particular ways. Uh, and another thing philosophers do that very often just skip, get skipped past in public debate is just explain what the terms of the debate are going to be. And even if they disagree, like just articulating up front, like, for example, salient for me, what do we mean by understanding? What yeah. is the semantics? So, so say what you believe those things are so that we can reason about them, not because we think they're the final definitions, but so that we can reason about them instead of presupposing everyone shares your definition and stumbling forward into what then turns out to be a very confusing discussion. <laughs> <laughs>